This is it. The answer to the ultimate question. The one everyone has an opinion on, yet which has no answer. The culmination of my tireless investigation to find out which graphics card is the greatest of all time. Too much? Alright, probably dial it back a bit. It seems like a simple enough question to ask, which graphics card is the greatest ever? Turns out, it's not as simple as you might think. You have to decide which cards count and which don't, and ultimately, what great actually means in the context of a piece of electronic wizardry that slots into your computer and becomes obsolete after a few years. There are plenty of candidates that might come to mind straight away. The GTX 750 Ti you bought as your first major upgrade. The Chinese RX 580 you bought during the scalper pandemic when all other GPUs cost way too much money. Or the sheer un godly powerhouse that is the GT 710, but for the sake of my time and money I had to boil it down to a single category of GPU. The number one candidate for the GPU GOAT, at least if you go by YouTube thumbnails, is the GTX 1080 Ti. If I'd been asked my opinion on the greatest of all time off the top of my head, it's probably the answer I'd have come up with, and I know a lot of other people would agree. The 1080 Ti didn't exist in a vacuum however, it was the successor to the 780 Ti and 980 Ti, and the predecessor to the RTX 2080 Ti and 3080 Ti, so if there were any other pretenders to the Pascal card's throne, the best candidate would probably be among those other 80 Ti's. This did mean I ended up ignoring a few higher end cards like the various Titans and Quadros as well as the RTX 3090. I was a bit uncertain on that last one as it was arguably the better buy than the RTX 3080 Ti but I held a poll and the 3090 lost. On the whole though, I didn't feel like this video would miss them. None of the Titan class cards I've ever tested have ever really compared to the best G-Forces, especially when considering value for money. Of course, Nvidia has competition for the GOAT crown, however, on several occasions in the last decade, AMD haven't had a Radeon that directly competed with the top-end non-Titan G-Forces, so in those cases I've simply chosen the highest-end consumer card they had on the market at the time. This is why the RX 5700 XT is here, and you might think having a mid-range card like that in the lineup is unfair, but as I've already alluded to, one of the metrics I'll be testing for is value for money, so perhaps it's not going to be quite the bloodbath you might expect. The list of graphics cards starts in 2013, with the first GPUs released since the launch of the 4K Ultra HD standard, and I've cut off the list at the RTX 30 and RX 6000 series. That's not necessarily because I think the current generation are going to do badly, because that would still be relevant information and I'm actually interested to see how the RTX 4080 Super and RX 7900 XTX would hold up. It is partly related to my budget, as those two cards would cost me more than every other GPU in this video combined. Did I mention I have a Patreon? link in the description. No, the biggest reason for missing the current generation is because of how I've chosen to judge GPU greatness. As someone whose channel is mostly about extending the life of older tech, I'm usually interested in how cards like the GTX 980 Ti and R9 290X for example perform in modern games. You could make an argument that a truly great GPU is one that holds up over time, like the aforementioned cards which are still able to run today's games at reduced settings. However, I obviously can't test the 
RX 6900 XT in games from 2029 yet, and it also doesn't make sense to compare an R9 290X to a 3080 Ti in Black Myth Wukong, so I came up with a test methodology that I think is the most fair overall solution. I picked five games from the year each GPU released, and another five from the year it was superseded. So, for example, I tested the R9 290X in five games from 2013 and five from 2015 when the R9 Fury X replaced it, and so on. As the RX 7900 XTX and RTX 4080 Super are still current at the time of writing and aren't due to be replaced until 2025, I couldn't test them in games that haven't been released yet, even if I had those cards to test. Perhaps in a year's time I'll make a follow-up. In the five previous videos of the GOAT project so far, I also included five games from the year of each card's predecessor, but in the process of making those videos I realised that idea was slightly flawed. On several occasions I came across a CPU or engine limitation, or just a frame rate that was so obscenely high that it gave an unfair advantage or disadvantage to certain generations of GPU. Also in those videos I was comparing Nvidia versus AMD in the same games, however because some GPUs released in different years to the card they were compared to, that meant I ended up playing fast and loose with the whole concept, so for this video I've stuck rigidly to games released in the same year as these specific GPUs. Anyway, after that massive preamble… Let's start with looking at how well these GPUs performed in the year of their release. Perhaps unsurprisingly, in 11th place is the RX 5700 XT. This was the last generation of cards AMD released before returning to the high end after a 5 year hiatus, so it was never really intended to compete directly with the RTX 2080 Ti, but it was the most powerful GPU of the first RDNA series, and so I think it's important to know how it fared. As it turned out, not well, coming in last in all three tested resolutions and scoring 71.5 FPS on average. In 10th place, the Radeon 7 was a GTX 1080 Ti competitor released a year after the RTX 2080 Ti. Thanks perhaps to its 16GB frame buffer, it beats the 5700 XT by a decent margin in 1440 and 2160p. Though, spoiler, it won't hold up as well in the next generation. In ninth place, it's another Radeon, the Vega 64. This hurts, as it's one of my favourite cheap GPUs on the used market, but in the context of its day, it just didn't hold up. Next, in 8th place is the Fury X, as the last time AMD tried to compete for the crown back in 2015, this would have gone head to head with the 980 Ti, but I guess this means it lost. In 7th place is the R9 290X, the first card so far to have an average score of over 100 FPS, which is pretty impressive considering it was released when 4K was hardly even a thing. In 6th, it's the first Nvidia on the list, the GTX 980 Ti. I have fond memories of this card as the most desirable one available when I return to PC gaming, and it beats the Fury X by 10%, but is still technically the worst of its kind. Next, uh, holy sh**, the mighty GTX 1080 Ti in 5th place! This is a disappointing showing for the pre-test favourite, but performance is not the only metric, so perhaps there's still time for it to make a comeback. In fourth, it's another upset, the GTX 780 Ti, a card which many owners will tell you didn't age well, but it seems like in its day it was the absolute dog's bollocks. The top three shouldn't be surprising, as in their respective launch years of 2018, 2020 and 2021, games were still being made with the PS4 and Xbox One in mind, and these GPUs were orders of magnitude more powerful. In third place, the RTX 2080 Ti, the first ray tracing capable card in its class, wasn't received particularly well for its price and underwhelming new features, but it seemed like it was an absolute monster in games from 2018. In second place is the most recent card in the test, the RTX 3080 Ti, and it's hard to overstate what a huge difference there is between this card and the rest. 
the gap between the 980 Ti and the 2080 Ti is less than 20%, while the gap between the 2080 Ti and 3080 Ti is over 20% on its own. What could possibly defeat it? Well, surprisingly, the number one card for performance is the Radeon RX 6900 XT. Just goes to show, when AMD apply themselves, they can really deliver the goods... sometimes. That's all well and good, however, it only really gives us a small snapshot of how these cards performed in their day. Pretty much nobody outside of the 1% upgrades their GPU each generation, however, so it's only fair to ask, how well did these GOAT contenders hold up when faced with their own successor? In 11th place, the card that held up worst in the year of its replacement was the R9 Fury X. By 2017, its average performance fell from 88.7 FPS to 61.5. Next, the Vega 64 once more embarrasses me by falling from 9th to 10th place and again averaging only just over 60 FPS. In 9th place, oh dear, how the mighty GTX 780 Ti has fallen. This is after only two years. Anyone who knows how Kepler performed later on won't be at all surprised. In 8th place, the R9 290X went from trailing the 780 Ti to just beating it by a small margin. The fact that this card can still run games in 2024 should go in its favour. But alas, it doesn't. In 7th, the GTX 980 Ti fell a couple of spots. Interestingly, it didn't hold up well at 4K, even compared to older GPUs. In 6th place is the Radeon 7, enjoying one last sip of GCN fine wine by actually scoring higher on average in 2020 than it did in 2019. In 5th, the RX 5700 XT takes the win for biggest improvement, rising from 11th place in its birth year and just beating the Radeon 7 from the same year. In 4th, a small improvement for the 1080 Ti, but still unimpressive considering the weight of expectations on it. The top three cards are the same, but the order's different. The 6900 XT falls from first to third, with its biggest failing coming at 4K. In second place is the 3080 Ti, the only card whose ranking doesn't change at all, but the winner is the 2080 Ti, just beating its successor by a tiny margin. Ok, so big picture time, and I'm not going to repeat the graphics from before, I'll just give you the charts. With all 10 games in consideration, the overall winner of greatest GPU of all time is the RTX 3080 Ti, with an average across all three resolutions of 146 FPS. The RX 6900 XT let itself down in the next gen titles, particularly at 4K, hence why it can only manage second place with an average of 139 FPS. In third is the RTX 2080 Ti at 127 FPS, and the bookies favourite 1080 Ti comes in fourth at 107 FPS. Now, I don't know about you, but this result doesn't sit right with me. The top three GPUs in terms of performance each had MSRPs of a thousand US dollars or more, and I already said I was dismissing the Titans and Quadros for their terrible price to performance. Perhaps greatness shouldn't just be defined by how these cards perform, but also how much they cost. For this comparison, I've calculated the cost per frame using the manufacturer's suggested retail price in USD, adjusted for inflation using usinflationcalculator.com as a reference. I'm using the average frame rate across all 10 games at all three resolutions. In 11th place is the R9 Fury X. This isn't a great shocker, at a launch price of $649 it sorely lacked in performance compared to the 980 Ti for the same price. In 10th is the Radeon 7, which was not only overpriced for its performance, it was also a generation late and a paper launch in many parts of the world. In 9th place is the 780 Ti, which, adjusted for inflation, was almost $950, so whatever performance lead it had over the 290X was not worth the asking price. 
In eighth is the 980 Ti, whose lower overall performance compared to the 780 Ti was offset by a $50 price cut, meaning for a cost per frame difference of only 30 cents. In seventh place, it's the third place card of the performance test, the 2080 Ti. Its $1,000 asking price in 2018 is over $1,250 in 2024, making it significantly more expensive than this year's 4080 Super. In sixth is the most expensive card of the test, the 3080 Ti. Its $1,200 asking price, almost $1,400 in 2024, means that despite topping the performance chart, each of those frames costs $10.49. Showing one of the reasons why I love it, the Vega 64 comes in fifth. This was never really a top tier card to begin with, but the value chart puts it ahead of some of the highest performance cards ever made. In fourth place, the RX 6900 XT's sky high asking price still managed to undercut the 3080 Ti while offering almost as much performance, and makes it the first card so far to have a cost per frame of under $10. In third place is the classic R9290X, which did the same trick of coming slightly under the 780 Ti in pure performance, but undercutting it by a whopping $200 in today's money. Second place, showing why people remember it so fondly, the GTX 1080 Ti is almost $900 in 2024 dollars, but that, combined with upper mid-table performance, makes it the best value flagship tier card ever made. I can say that confidently because the number one card goes to the RX 5700 XT. Even adjusted for inflation, this mid-range GPU was under $500, and that more than makes up for the fact that it came ninth in performance. I don't know, I, I feel that's just not a particularly satisfactory conclusion either. I don't think anyone in their right mind would have had the RX 5700 XT down as the greatest GPU of all time. Value is important, especially when it comes to real-world buying decisions, but that's not really what this video is about. Maybe true greatness is somewhere in between, maybe not the absolute best performance, and maybe not the best value, but a perfect balance of the two. With that in mind, what if I gave each card a position of 1 to 11 for performance and 1 to 11 for value, and then take an average of the two? In 7th place, it's the Fury X again. As best cards of their generation go, I think this is categorically the worst. It's a shame, because I like the idea of mini ITX flagships, but mandatory water cooling was a weird compromise. In 6th, it's the Radeon 7, a card which maybe shouldn't have existed at all, and to many people pretty much didn't. In 5th place is the Vega 64, to my eternal shame. Shout out to all the folks in the comments who bring up how it could be undervolted and overclocked into a beast! In joint fourth place, the GTX 780 Ti and 980 Ti. In joint third place, it's a three-way tie between the R9 290X, the RTX 2080 Ti, and the RX 5700 XT, the latter of which is standing rather unsteadily on the podium, pretending not to be three kids in a trench coat. In second place, the mighty, yet pricey, RTX 3080 Ti. And the winner is another tie. The RX 6900 XT came second in performance and fourth in value, and the GTX 1080 Ti scored fourth for performance and second for value. There you have it, folks. That's why people put their money on the 1080 Ti as the GOAT. It might not be the best performer of all time, but by virtue of having solid enough performance and specs that will remain relevant for years, and being the last flagship card Nvidia would release before deciding all of your money belongs to them, it comes out on top. As for the 6900 XT, what can I say? If AMD really are going to stop competing at the top end of gaming GPUs, they're doing consumers and themselves a disservice. And there we have it, the Radeon RX 6900 XT and the GeForce GTX 1080 Ti, officially the greatest GPUs of all time. 
Is this a definitive result? A flawless test with no argument to be made about the results? No room for reinterpretation? Yes, absolutely. There are no holes whatsoever in my methodology, RT and DLSS have no bearing on the results, and there's no point ever testing another legacy GPU ever again. Glad we could sort this out. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.